South Florida is a treasured region of our nation. From the Everglades to the Keys, a vast wilderness, people come to marvel at its wildlife, above ground and underwater. But mainly, people come to restore perspective. The Keys are so unique. There are, you know, I can, I can start from a very factual point of view and say, you know, it's the only subtropical part of the United States. There are plants and things that grow here that don't grow anywhere in the United States. But it goes beyond that. The Keys it has a magical sense to it. Residents like Fran Decker have settled in the Keys, enjoying a lifestyle largely dependent on thriving tourism. Once a tourist herself, Juanita Green made South Florida her home nearly half a century ago, taking in her amazing surroundings on the Anhinga Trail in Everglades National Park. Juanita will tell you there's more to this treasured place than meets the eye. Well, one of the things that it is is the silence. You know, no horns and no, uh, just no noise except the natural noise and you can hear the wind blowing. Lovers of the outdoors naturally value all South Florida has to offer, but sweeping tracts of undeveloped land means something to everyone. The great, great value of the Everglades is that it's nudged right up against a huge, densely populated area. And even people who never come to the Everglades are comforted with the thought that the Everglades is out there. The value of the Everglades, and by the way, it is a, a World Heritage Site, it's an International Biosphere Reserve, and it's also an international uh, wetland of importance. And um, my feeling is, is that the Everglades National Park provides a, a very unique opportunity to the, uh, to the residents of South Florida. It is uh, the largest wilderness area uh, east of the Rockies. It is an incredible natural area. Insiders refer to the greater Everglades ecosystem, mile upon mile of intact wetlands, a low country where only an inch of rise in elevation can spell the difference between grassy prairie and wooded hammock. The system, spanning some one and a half million acres, has endured much, losing 50% of its water flow to neighboring agricultural activity and burgeoning development. But confronting South Florida today, there's the overarching environmental problem, global warming. Yes, global warming is very real, and it's not something for the future. It's, in fact, happening now. And yes, it will have an increasing influence on the Everglades and all of our coastal and low-lying environments. The polar ice caps are melting as our planet heats up. That spells danger for low-lying areas around the globe especially troubling to scientists observing change in South Florida is a dramatically evolving landscape along the coast. And we're beginning to see dramatic changes in the boundary between the mangrove and whatever's behind it, either water or freshwater swamp. And all of this is because for South Florida, for instance, we have had a relative sea level rise of nine to 10 inches since 1930. This is an increase in the rate of sea level rise of eight to nine times what had been going on for the last 2,000 years. And that's, that's dramatic. It's close to catastrophic. In the next 100 years, if something isn't done to limit and lower global warming pollution, Earth's seas will continue to rise, according to Dr. Wandless, by another two feet Park officials are concerned. Um, I'm concerned about uh, sea level rise since the relief here is so low. Um, we're seeing areas that would in fact be inundated in a change of habitat from sawgrass prairie to more mangrove salt dominated uh, ecosystems. Across Florida Bay, much damage has already been done. Now add another two feet of sea. The redrawn coastline spells significant loss of wetland habitat for wading birds and freshwater aquatics. Global warming means rising seas, rising temperatures, and rising uncertainty about the weather. Scientists are concerned about the increased heat rising off the oceans and intensifying hurricanes. This year, with Hurricanes uh, Katrina and Wilma, in both those cases, we experienced a storm surge 
here at Everglades National Park. Uh, we did, uh, in Katrina, we had a storm surge down at Flamingo that was uh, from three to four feet. And then uh, six weeks later in Wilma, we had a storm surge of from eight to nine feet. And um, I am concerned that uh, um, increases in sea level or sea level rise would exacerbate those kind of impacts. Even if the hurricane level stays the same, with rising sea level, we will have an increased impact by hurricanes because they will reach farther in, they will move more sand on barrier islands, they will cut more inlets, and so on. And so, even without worrying about the increase, likely, in my mind, increase in hurricanes, we're still going to have a dramatically increased influence from hurricanes. South Florida, itself an ancient coral reef, connects to the country's only living barrier reef environment. Having logged over 18,000 dive hours in these waters, Dr. Billy Causey treasures the Florida Keys. The Keys are an incredibly special place. And in fact, this environment is unlike any other environment in the coastal United States. Coral reefs are the most biologically diverse community in the marine environment around the, around the world. The natural beauty here, as abundant above water as below, attracts thousands of tourists. And some, falling in love with wild beaches like Bahia Honda State Park, make the Keys their home. Those are some of my absolute favorite places in the Keys. And I, I love beaches and I love anywhere where the ocean and the land comes together. And that beach tends to be kind of wild and windswept. As with the rest of South Florida, global warming is taking its toll on the Florida Keys. Signs above ground and below alert marine biologists of serious health problems related to warming seas. Scientists are certain that there are changes taking place, uh, climate changes uh, that we are able to record. We're seeing this in the coral reef environment. The coral reefs are really the canary in the coal mine in that we are seeing changes take place. Frozen ice caps of the Arctic and Antarctic and coral reefs together represent the most stable environments in geologic time. Coral reefs exist in a narrow temperature range between 65 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Coral bleaching, while a natural part of a symbiotic relationship supporting coral growth and algae, now appears at unprecedented levels around the world. Massive coral bleaching events were first observed in the mid-70s and they have picked up in frequency since then evolving from isolated local events to regional to global in scale. The global warming part of global warming is, is increased temperature. And very clearly that is going to be a disaster for the tropics because many of the organisms that live in our shallow seas like warm water, but they will die in hot water. Dying fish, major losses of sea urchins, sponges and corals, Intensified hurricanes and rising sea levels inundating and permanently redrawing coastlines. Such are the global warming impacts that threaten our most treasured places. So there are challenges with global warming, but there are also opportunities. And if businesses seize these opportunities, we will see innovation flow forward. That's why we're seeing businesses like General Electric, DuPont, and British Petroleum provide leadership but we need other sectors to engage, like the agriculture sector, where they can actually grow fuels where we used to mine fossil fuels, and that will provide cleaner sources of energy that reduce global warming pollution. This innovation will not happen without government involvement. Voluntary measures don't work. Time and time again, we've seen where the government sets the rules of the road, industry responds with technology and innovation. The best example is the acid rain provisions of the Clean Air Act. We had success there. We can have success again using the same measures for global warming pollution. But we're gonna need government leadership, involvement and innovation from industry, and the support of every citizen. As our cities balloon with development, that growth causes increased consumption of electricity, driving more cars, and shrinking wild areas, all causing pollution that exacerbates global warming. Taking time to reflect, Juanita peers out on a scene that for many decades has never failed to lift her spirits. And it's real. 
It's not contrived. It's part of the natural system. And we connect to the natural system as we're part of the natural system. And we need to associate with it. That's the sort of the spiritual part of the Everglades, the need for the Everglades.